Hello and welcome to Factually. I'm Adam Conover. Thank you so much for joining me once again as I talk to an incredible expert about all the amazing things that they know that I don't know and that you might not know. Both of our minds are going to get blown together and we're going to have so much fun doing it. Now, I think if you watch this show, if you listen to this show, by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe in your favorite podcast player. And if you're listening on your favorite podcast player, go check us out on YouTube. We're uploading video episodes now. If you're a fan of this show, you probably think of yourself as an intelligent person, right? Or at least as a person who loves to learn. But that word intelligence is really strange because as a society, our understanding of intelligence is all wrong. Take the famous IQ test. It was started in the early 20th century as a way to identify French children who needed help in school, and it provided age-specific questions across a couple domains of knowledge, like verbal and spatial, and then computed a score in comparison to others who took the test. And 100 was average. That's where the intelligence test began. But somehow... This tool for helping little French children get the support to do their little French math problems became the measure of intelligence. The U.S. went on to use it to sort World War I recruits, and soon eugenicists, both in America and Nazi Germany, just loved having a sciencey tool to justify their preconceptions that some people were innately smarter than others. People in power used the IQ test, this fallible thing made up to help French kids, as the basis for policy, racist policy. And of course, I might not need to say this to you because you're all smart people, but this is bullshit. Intelligence is much more than just your answers to a specific question on a specific test on a specific day. We also know now, as a matter of scientific fact, that IQ is not innate. It is not solely genetically determined because over the 20th century, IQ points kept increasing three to five points for the entire population on average every decade. Every decade, we were supposedly getting three to five IQ points smarter. And, you know, if it were genetically determined, that wouldn't be uh, possible. This is called the Flynn effect, and it directly indicates that IQ cannot be genetically determined. There must be something else going on as well. And even more interestingly, or perhaps depressingly, recent tests have found that for the first time, IQ scores across the U.S. are in fact going down. Now, you might hear that and want to yell, idiocracy, reality shows are the problem, I always said so, and that's your right as an American, okay, to make that claim. But researchers think that something more interesting is happening. Perhaps there's a ceiling to intelligence, or that once there's a certain level of access to nutrition and education and environmental justice in a society, that our scores plateau. Or maybe there's been a legitimate change in the skills you need to succeed in our society. The nature of what constitutes intelligence might have, in fact, changed. Think about that. Tellingly, while some IQ scores went down in this recent study, spatial rotational skills, the kinds you need to play, say, video games, actually went up. Food for thought, at the very least. There are so many theories about what intelligence actually is, how to measure it, and how it's determined. But Whatever theory you ascribe to, you have to accept that our concept of it as a society is sorely lacking. There simply must be more to this story. And to help us find out what it is, we have an incredible expert on the show today. Her name is Dr. Rena Bliss, and she's a professor of sociology at Rutgers and the author of Rethinking Intelligence, A Radical New Understanding of Our Human Potential. Now, I know that you're going to love this interview, but before we get to it, I just want to remind you that I'm going on tour this year. If you're in San Francisco, I'll be there from May 5th through 6th. If you're in San Antonio, Texas, I'll be there from May 11th through 13th. And if you're in Batavia, Illinois, I'll be there from June 8th through June 10th. Come out and see me. And if you want to support this show, I want to remind you that you can do so on Patreon. Head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Just five bucks a month gets you every episode of the show ad free and a whole bunch of extra goodies. Now, without further ado, let's get to my interview with Dr. Rena Bliss. Rena, thank you so much for coming on Factually. Thank you so much for having me. So you have a new book coming out called Rethinking Intelligence. What are the biggest misconceptions that we have about intelligence as a society? Is that a good place to start? Yeah, it's a great place to start. I mean, the number one misconception is that intelligence is really your IQ score. I mm. think that that is one of those weird kind of cultural beliefs that has been so pervasive for so long. I mean, centuries at this point, right? And yet we can't seem to shake it. We've had a lot of really insightful intelligence research in the last like 
50 years, let's say, that has told us that there's more to intelligence than IQ. But for some reason, IQ still hangs on as being like this major, you know, way of de defining our intelligence and how smart we are. If someone has yeah. a high IQ score, they are considered really smart. If you have a low IQ score, you're considered really dumb, you know? So, um, and then another part of that is that your intelligence is defined by your genetics or your genes. Your DNA mm. gives you your intelligence. I think that's another super big misconception that is still really, really strong, even in science, you know? So like there's a lot of genetic science around intelligence and IQ and like people are still looking for markers or variants that are associated with IQ scores. So it's like, uh, yeah. And the, those two ideas are trend. linked, right? Because the idea yeah. of an, of an IQ score is that there's some sort of immutable score about you that like your height or maybe like your weight where your weight can fluctuate, but we sort of believe there's a genetic component to it. You know, you're you're uh, born at, at a you know with such a combination of factors that your weight is going to be about here. You can make it go up or down. Um, we have a lot of there are a lot of things about people like that. Uh, the you know you, your length of your feet or whatever. But yeah. once you start poking at the idea of IQ scores at all, it starts to seem like frankly kind of ridiculous that this sort of one measurement that was come up with you know within the last couple hundred years. Uh, would somehow measure everything about someone's intellectual quality and you could ascertain it through a test of probably a, a hundred questions or so that seems kind of ludicrous. What is the history of that idea? And when did we start to realize that it was bullshit? Well, sadly, we have known for a while that there are problems with IQ tests and, um, and the history of IQ even more sadly is that it comes from this really early kind of look at intelligence from a genetic standpoint that was done when people were just flat out racist. And so mm -hmm. like the whole creation of the notion of different intelligences and rankable IQs and all of this stuff comes from one of our first um, geneticists that ever looked at behavior, uh, Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. And mm -hmm. he was just the most flat out racist guy ever. This is the guy, <laughs> he, is he known as the father of eugenics? Do I have that right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So eugenics was, um, was like basically his, his form of genetics and that he introduced and it stuck because it really was the basis of all our genetic science until quite recently. And, um, and he was knighted. So he's like, Sir Francis Galton, you know, wow. he's just like, he's only had, a lot of good things said about him for a really long time. But at the same time, um, we have been discrediting the eugenics, you know, kind of idea of rankable races and rankable intelligences and all of that mm -hmm. stuff in the last breeding say, humans for, for qualities we want or we don't want. Like we have a exactly. real moral revulsion because of what happened across the 20th century as a result exactly. of these ideas, but also they're no longer scientifically uh, there's no basis for them. We now believe. Right, exactly. So, so we know that that's a problem. And yet, still today, there are researchers who are looking for, like I was just saying, genetic kind of culprits for intelligence as measured by IQ tests. So we're still mm. having the hunt go on for the same thing that we already discredited or have been kind of trying to dismantle for the last, you know, 50 years. And so it's still like, there's, there's kind of like a, um, like a split in how research is being done. A lot of research is trying to discredit and then a lot, and then some research, little pockets of genetics, you know, um, genomics, which is like the newer version of genetic science that looks at like our whole entire genome in our bodies and everything. So um, there are little pockets where people are still doing that gene hunt and trying to say like, some of us are just born smart and some of us are born dumb and some, many of us are born average, whatnot, but um, you know, the, I think the mainstream of science has advanced our thinking on it. The mainstream of science is showing us that intelligence is way more than just, you know, how well we perform on a test at a yeah. given moment, a snapshot. Um, also, there's so much research out there that shows that the tests are biased. 
yeah. that they're culturally biased. They're even racially biased. Like there are all mm-hmm. kinds of biases in the tests themselves, like the questions themselves. So, um, and then also like there's the biases that we don't even see, which are like how much, you know, a person has, how much privilege they've had to make it to the test, to the room or to the, you know, right. to the online system and be healthy enough to take the test. And what is the purpose of the test? You know, like I I imagine there's a big Mm -hmm. difference between if I were like, hey, I want to go join Mensa, right? Which is a club that you can get in if you score high enough on an intelligence test, right? Now, first of all, that's a weird idea to have a club that you can get into if you do like, let's start a club for people who can pass the test we made up. Already, that's a weird idea. Why would I want to be a member of that club? I'm not really sure. Like, so I can sit around and with tea and go like, oh, we sure all did well on that test, didn't we? Like, what the (laughs) fuck is the point of that? Um, But if I if I decide, hey, I'm a you know, I'm a college educated person who values my intelligence very highly. I value it so highly. I want to try to get into this club and I'm going to take a test. Right. And I go take that test. I'm taking it under very different circumstances than someone who is a uh, foster child with a history of acting out in school. And then a counselor says, hold on a second, maybe there's something wrong with that boy. And then they take them into a special room inside their disadvantaged public school and give them a test to figure out whether or not they need to send the kid to some kind of remedial program, you know, out in out in the country or whatever. Even if you're taking the same test, right, in those two circumstances, which which I'm going to guess you're probably not. The circumstances under which that test is being administered are hugely different depending on who's being taken. it. I'm just spitballing, but does that sound oh, accurate? Oh, you got it. This is exactly what I wrote about in, in the book, you know, and I, I think that um, another part of it is that there are people and there are services and like consultancies that you can hire to coach your kids to do well on the tests. Of course. Also, there are other kinds of ways to tweak your test scores to boost your test scores. Um, you know, taking stimulants is one way. Oh, yeah. Um, another. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, look, hey, I got a, I got a 1490 on the SAT, and I do think the Ritalin prescription has something to do with it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. I don't um, mean to brag. That's then... not that high. I don't, I, 40, 49 is pretty good, but I, yeah. I, I don't, I, I do remember it. Okay. I'm outing myself as a guy who remembers his SAT score. Um, but, <laughs> but, but uh, to this point, like even those types of, of tests have been like uh, really fallen into disfavor just among college admissions. And that's for a much narrower purpose of like, you know, standard, the idea exactly. of standardized testing at all, we're starting to realize is kind of an oxymoron and, and doesn't work. Yes. Yeah. It's so true. Um, and so it's just like this, this idea that we can just measure somebody's intelligence with a snapshot moment of how well they performed on a test and then track their whole education based off of that, or, you know, give Mm -hmm. them certain services or take away services from them. I mean, the whole idea of it is kind of crazy to me. There are even um, some people who are doing that genetic, you know, kind of gene hunt kind of research out there that say that, you know, that some of us are winners of a genetic lottery and other people are losers. And therefore, you know, the winners, you know, need to be treated one way in school and the losers need to be treated another way in school. And, um, and so like we should be DNA testing all of the people Mm. in, in our schools and DNA test kids when they're, you know, even DNA test embryos, you know, DNA test fetuses and whatnot. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, kind of misinformation out there and ideas that I think are a little bit dangerous, you know, um, maybe they're not as bad as, as when we have, we had like, you know, our leaders of our, of our countries telling us that we needed to sterilize and euthanize so called like euthanize um yeah people based on their iq scores well, <laughs> and people were people were sterilized euthanized or had uh brain surgery uh, done on them you know exactly. as a result of these scores uh yeah. so that that's not that's not like theoretical it's not something that was just in movies this mm-hmm. was like something that was that was literally done to people um uh, let me just bring it to this though like beyond the test something that always seemed ludicrous to me about the test but the notion of idea of intelligence in general is the idea that intelligence is one thing like the the notion of there being a single number that you can apply to an iq score uh you can apply to intelligence 
carries with it the implicit notion that there's one factor called intelligence as there is with height um, or with, but you know, even if we're talking about strength, like a person's strength, there's multiple dimensions. There's how much can you deadlift and there's how much you can bench press. And those are two different numbers. How much can you Mm -hmm. bicep curl, right? There are different muscles that do different things. Um, And we also know that that's the person who could bench press might not be able to do a yoga pose, right? Like we're, Mm -hmm. we're aware Mm -hmm. of this with the physical body. The same is true of intelligence, right? Like we're, this is a word that means a lot of different things. Definitely. And that's why I offer this new way of looking at it, a new definition, if you will. Mm. So I say, instead of using scores like SAT scores and IQ scores and all of these standardized test scores that we have, instead of looking at these, these scores, that again are just a snapshot of how you happen to perform in this very moment, in t- one moment in time. And um, let's look at intelligence as learning from our environment. It's something mm. that we all do. We do it all day long. You don't have to be neurotypical or seem like a brainiac to do it. You actually do it. You know, there are very um, am- amazing ways that we've shown in the last like, you know, 20 years of research that people who are neurodivergent are highly intelligent and have different ways of exercising their intelligence. Mm. And so, you know, this is a, a better definition. I think it's more accurate. It's more precise. And it's, it's what we do as humans. We are intelligent. We have infinite potential to learn from our environments. We just need to be empowered to do that. And, you know, this also relates to one of the topics that I bring up a lot in the book, which is the um, you know, taking care of ourselves and reducing stress in our lives. Because one of the, the things that really hampers us and hinders our ability to learn from our environments is stress and feeling yeah. that stress and having it percolate through our bodies and through our, you know, all of our, our cells and our organs and all of, you know, um, you know, down to, to our DNA, it actually affects and can modify our DNA in really harmful ways. So like stress mm. is super toxic for us. And so, you know, I, I'm trying to get us to the point where we see that all of us are intelligent and that we also see that all of us have this huge responsibility to empower ourselves and each other to be less stressed and to be able to exercise that intelligence, to see that there are opportunities to learn for all of us at all different moments of our lives and to, to do that learning, foster that learning instead of comparing us and saying like, Oh, you were born, you're great don't need to worry about you. Oh, all you people, you're no good. We're going to, you know, put you in some weird room and kind of like not give you really much of an education anymore. You know, um, instead of seeing it like that, look at all of us as individuals. We're all different. We all have different, like you were saying strengths. We all have different things that we need to strengthen, you know, and, um, and help every single person to do those things. Yeah. I mean, what you say about stress makes total sense to me. I know that when I've been under periods of extreme stress, it feels like my, my brain stops working. Uh, Mm -hmm. and you know, that's when I, uh, and the stress that I'm under frankly is, is, you know, career related stress, job related stress, um, things of that nature, uh, in school, you know, studying related stress. Uh, I've never been under true like life strain the way some people are. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, what it reminds me of actually is, is coming back to that example that I used of the conditions under which tests are taken, like the, the number of stressors that you hear from teachers, kids in public schools are often facing, right. When they have stress at home and that affects them at school. And, and of course they're not going to perform well as well on, on a test or, or, you know, perform well, uh, be able to learn as well when they're under all that stress. It, It almost makes me think of, uh, I kept mentioning height as being something that's genetically determined, but in fact, height is also, uh, uh, dependent on your upbringing, right? Like, yes. uh, I believe, and I'm going to say this very generally, but I believe that over the last couple of centuries, Americans have gotten taller on average. And the reason mm-hmm. is not genetic. The reason is because, uh, people started to eat better. Uh, people started to yes. have more access to food. The cost of food went down. Um, there was less starvation, less famine. We still have a problem with hunger in this country, but it's nothing compared to what it was a hundred years ago, 150 years ago. Um, and as a result, people are taller. And so there's a genetic component, but also if you are, if, if you're raised in a condition where you didn't get enough to eat as a kid, you're not going to grow as much. Um, and, uh, uh, that's, uh, is, is that analogous yeah, to intelligence in some way? That is a perfect analogy because really, um, intelligence actually is the same way. 
We mm. have seen over the last generation, two generations, even going back three generations, we've seen IQ scores, test scores all across the board going up, up, up. And it goes up with development, with standard of living rising. It goes up with um, basically, you know, access to quality food, access to better um, sleep and better, um, yeah. you know, air and water, every, all of the environmental things like that. And also like, you know, improved kind of levels of stress in terms of like people's livelihoods getting better, you know, more humane living existence, living conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of thing you see, even just like those flawed test scores are all shooting up thanks to standards of living going up. And when you, when you do these comparisons in, um, in different parts of the world, what you find are that anywhere where there's been an uptick in living conditions, you get an uptick in scores and you get an uptick in height and you get an mm. up, uptick in basically anything that is partially genetic and very much environmentally yeah. um, determined as well, you know? And so it's really important that we, that we think like, okay, how can we increase everybody's standard of living so that we're not yeah. just comparing apples and oranges and then saying like the apples, well, they just happen to be born perfect, you know, and yeah. these others are, these oranges are total losers, you know, it's like, yeah. well, did we empower those people to be winners? You know, yeah. saying it's just their genes is really just flat out lying about where the inequality lies. Yeah. And we don't need to, like this doesn't need to just be a social argument. Like it's borne out by the facts, right? Like I've read yeah. that, oh, yeah. uh, that air quality, you mentioned air quality in your list. And I'm like, mm -hmm. ah, yes, I have read in the last couple of years that there's like a really definite link between air quality, even on a moment to moment basis and how well your brain is functioning. Is that, do I have that right? Yes, you do. Yeah. And, um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention about where the science has taken us is, is towards this idea of neuroplasticity. So mm. we have all of this great neuroscience showing us that our brains are changing. They are malleable and they can grow and develop throughout our whole lives. Mm. Yes. We grow and develop in crazy ways when we're infants and then when we're babies and toddlers and, you know, children and, and things kind of, take a different form as we get older, right? But we are still changing. We're still growing. We can still create new, what they call neural networks. And so it's really important for us to seize on this opportunity to always grow. We can do that because our brains want us to do that, right? Yeah. And so it's just, um, yeah, this idea that like we are limited to some kind of score that we took when we were five years old, you know, as, <laughs> as I did when I was five, you know, and that's when my whole educational path, you know, started to get cemented into place, you know, and my students too, I have, you know, I'm a professor now as well. And I have students who have all kinds of horrendous stories of being tested when they were three years old, you know, yeah. to get into preschool and, um, and then, you know, getting tracked from that age. And so it's not just something that happened to, um, you know, millennial moms and whatnot, you know, it's also like a, a whole, um, and gen, gen Xs and Xennials and, you know, all of the different, different people from who are like, you know, adults, like full, full on yeah. grow, adulting right now, you know, but also like, you know, young people, 17 year olds. 16 year olds that I have that you know, are telling me like, this is what I'm going through right now. Like this is, I'm at the tail end of the high school experience that all got me here due to this one test I took when I was three years old, you know, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Yeah, well, man, that's a great note to take us into our first break. We'll be right back with Marina Bliss. 
Hey everybody, you probably got a lot of important data on your computer and you're probably living in fear that one day that computer is gonna crash or you are gonna lose it and you are going to lose all of that data. I know you're thinking maybe it's in the cloud somewhere, but let's face it, you don't actually pay for that upgraded cloud service that your, your OS provider is trying to sell you and you don't trust it anyway. It's not encrypted well enough. You can't get the files that you need. And so many people, I know you have a friend who this happened to, their computer crashed and they went in the cloud and they couldn't get all their stuff back, right? It's a real problem. Well, if you want to solve that problem, if you want to sleep safely and soundly, knowing that all of your stuff is secure, I really recommend Backblaze. And let me tell you something, this is a sponsor that I use myself. I have been a Backblaze user even before they decided to sponsor this show, which is why I am so proud to be able to uh, tell you about them today. For just $7 a month with no gimmicks, add-ons, or gotchas, they will give you unlimited backup for your Mac or PC or your business. That's movies, music, photos, videos, projects, contracts, all the data. You will never hear from Backblaze, oh, you need to upgrade to get a couple extra gigabytes. No, unlimited backup, okay? They have nearly two exabytes of data storage under management. That is so many bytes that I don't even know how big an exabyte is, okay? Almost two, oh, here it is. They wrote it right down for me. That's almost two billion gigabytes of data that they have stored for people, and they have restored 55 billion files for customers around the world. Through their web interface, you can restore your files for access anywhere in the world. Uh, they will ship you a hard drive with your data on it. Uh, you can buy a full hard drive restore for them, then send the hard drive back within 30 days and get a full refund on it. For just an extra two bucks a month, you can increase your retention history to one year, which is really impressive. And let me tell you something, this is also the number one rated backup service. They're recommend, recommended by the New York Times, Mac world pc world lifewire wired tom's guide nine to five mac and more and they have a 15 day no credit card required free trial at backblaze.com slash factually which will give you plenty of time to see how the system works but let me tell you something i use it myself it's so easy you install it it runs in the background it silently uploads all of your files and it never tells you you are out of space it just freaking works okay backblaze is the no hassle online backup so if you want a free trial and to see what it's all about head to backblaze.com slash factually and tell them adam sent you it's a nice cheesy way to end an ad read right okay we're back with rena bliss uh so we've been talking about intelligence and and how it, neuro, neuroplasticity and how it can improve throughout our lives uh i'd love to talk more though about or, you know, we want every, everybody to be as intelligent as possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, yeah. There's a, there's a big desire. Oh, how do we improve our schools? And, and uh, how do we, how, how do we help kids be smarter, et cetera? Um, but in the, in the reading that you've done about, uh, you know, all the different research about this or um, yeah. what are the factors that are not normally taken into account? We, we talked before the break about air quality. And I think yes. about, you know, a couple of years ago, I went to, I visited Mumbai, um, visit some friends there uh, in India mm -hmm. and the worst air quality of any place I'd ever visited. You, you felt it, you know, as soon as you stepped outdoors after a couple hours outside, you could taste it in the air, you know, that's a very yeah. well-known problem in India. Um, but I'm like, man, if there's a link between air quality and some measure of intelligence, I don't want to say it's IQ tests or whatever, but you know, mm -hmm. if you're not able to think as well, then that I can only imagine the deleterious effect on, you know, entire generations. Right. Um, yes, or you know, yeah. and that's not simply places like that. There's places in the U S that, um, you know, depending on where you live in Los Angeles, where I live right now, different areas have different air quality. If you live right next to a freeway, um, which, you know, freeways are driven through, you know, the communities of people of color here in Los Angeles, specifically, exactly. it's a matter of, of, of straight up history. Um, yeah. it, and present day I, zoning. It's so true. I mean, there's, there's so much great research being done out of UCLA and, mm. um, I used to be a professor in the UC system. So I, I'm very familiar with my colleagues, my former colleagues, you know, in the UC system down there who are doing really great research about that. But, um, but yeah, this is all, all to that point that I haven't really named yet um, today, but that is you know, a big part of, of my research, which is epigenetics. So mm. it turns out that you know, for all of these, again, centuries, we were focusing on our genes and saying like, oh, our genes just determine you know, our quality of our thinking and our brain function and all of this stuff. And then, um, wow, guess what? When we started to... Un 
um, to kind of open up the genome and look at all the genes working together and what they actually do together, we found out that there were these parts of our um, of our strands of DNA that were regulating whether our genes could turn on or off. And we right. now have named them the epigenome. And the people who study that are epigeneticists. And what they do is they say, okay, what happens when you increase the air quality? What happens to the genome? Well, it looks like it goes to work. It does what it's supposed to do. Mm. So it turns out that we are not so different no matter where we do live and where we are born, we're not so different in, inside, but what's different is what you're pointing to outside, right? Mm. And so our environments are different from each other. And what happens is when you have toxic um, exposures and stress is a huge one for, for human beings. So, but yeah. bad air, bad food, you know, bad, um, bad water, bad, yeah bad work working conditions is a huge one too. And that's a social environment thing. All of yeah. these environments, when you have that, your genes stay turned off. Isn't that so mm. crazy? Like wow. they're, they're there and they're in all of your cells and they're supposed to go to work, but they don't go to work. They stay asleep. And so what happens is your epigenome basically um, fails you and Wow. So all that great brain function, all that neuroplasticity, all that like growth and development and all that learning from the environment that I'm like saying, let's do that. It's just like, it can't happen. Right. And so it, it's always going to be this, this question of like, how can we equalize our environments? How can we make sure that people have what they need, the basics of what they need, and they don't have all these harmful toxins, you know, crowding their, um, you know, their, their air and their, living space and their living conditions, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's this tiresome uh, binary that's always put on this of nature versus nurture. And it's mm -hmm. usually used to sort of shut down this conversation. Oh, you're just arguing nature versus nurture, you know, but the yeah. truth is a lot more complicated than that. The, the truth mm -hmm. is that those two things interact and nurture, by the way, makes you imagine you're just talking about upbringing and, you know, did the kid get to watch Mr. Rogers or whatever, like that kind yeah. of thing. But we're talking about the more broad sense of nature and, and nurture, frankly. We're talking about exactly. like the, the entire environment that you're in and how that interacts with your genetics. Uh, exactly, and yeah. It's, yeah. It's a so lot I'm more not, complex than that binary. Right, exactly. I'm not saying that genes don't matter because they do matter. And they matter and they give us that basic brain structure, that architecture in our brains to be able to do the thinking we need to do, right? And and like let's not let our environments go and shut that whole process down, you know, or, yeah. and you know, it's the, the most, um, kind of, uh, I don't know, just like kind of prescient wise thing about what you just said is that about the future generations is that mm. the epigenome is actually passed down from generation to generation. So it is part, it's like with your genes, you're, tweaks all those modifications are passed down to your kids and they pass them down to their kids and on and on and on really so it's like if we are giving ourselves a bad run this lifetime it's actually going to affect the future wow. um, it's it's very like it's very unfortunate in some ways but then it's also hopeful in other ways because if you do improve the current situation then you can improve generations to come yeah and it feels like when people I don't want to harp too much on the bad old ideas of the past or the people who are still trying to promote those ideas. But mm -hmm. when people harp too much on the genetic component um, and you hear it still in present day, there's there's authors like uh, I, I don't know, I feel like Stephen Pinker does this sometimes. Um, yeah, but where, where they sort of, okay, good. All right. I'm glad I'm not mischaracterizing, um, where they yeah. go, Oh, you know, genetics is so important and people don't want to acknowledge it because it's not PC to acknowledge it, but it's so true. And like, when you look at the blah, blah, blah. And first of all, I feel like when people like him are making that argument, they're ignoring the facts that you're bringing. They're ignoring exactly. the in incredible wealth of information we have about how the environment affects and about how similar people truly are and about how the differences become magnified 
by uh, not just environment, but um, not just upbringing, but like the the day to day conditions that people live in. Um, that's the first thing uh, mm-hmm. that they themselves are ignoring facts. But secondly, it's it's profoundly hopeless to to put to to say of people, well, it's genetic determinism. Uh, you know, if if people are dumb now, their kids are going to be dumb, and that's just their lot in life. So why don't we just consign them to the labor camps basically? Right. And like, they can right. just like smelt pig iron and the rest of us will read books. Like that's, that's a, I, I don't you want to be an optimist about it? Don't you want to, don't you want to like uh, help your fellow people and say, Hey, we can, we can all improve as a species, you know, as a, as, as a, as a population why by caring for each other, you know? Yeah. Especially because, um, there have been a lot of really good data um, scientists who have tested IQ tests. And what they mm-hmm. found is that if you pay people, they do better on the tests. You can, <laughs> you can improve people's scores by paying them. Another thing is like I was saying, stimulants. Another one is, um, is also um, you can drive down test scores by saying kind of negative things to people. If you harsh their mellow before they go into a test, or if you uh-huh. say, especially stereotypes are the worst. If you say anything stereotypical, um, that is, that could, mm. you know, be a negative slight on them, they will do worse. So it's like, you can boost scores, you can drive down scores. It's totally artificial. And it's with these things that are like stress or with, giving people money and giving them incentives, you know, or, um, and also they've shown that actually people get really big boosts. They can even jump up a whole so-called intelligence bracket from being Mm. average to being above average or being, or from being below average to being becoming average, um, based on like changing their standard of living during their lifetime. So um, we're talking about adoptees, kids who are, you know, born into one circumstance and then uh, changed, you know, their circumstance and their socioeconomic status, basically. So yeah. it's like, there are all these, or, or people moving and having like wealth all of a sudden and, you know, and then just, and then of course there's what I was mentioning earlier on, which is that there are just straight up test consultants who will like, right. you know, give your kids the score you want them to have, you know? So, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of them that for the around test. SATs like, and stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I took all those courses. I mean, when I was, a <laughs> when I was a kid taking the SATs, it was like, yeah, you take the courses that, and that'll yeah. help you that you do the test prep and the entire, at the time, this is, this is, this episode is not about SATs, but it is right. still stunning to me <laughs> that I took the mm-hmm. test in the late nineties. Um, and yeah. at the time, the college board and all the rest of them were still uh, promoting the idea that you could not study for the test. They had designed the SATs so that it was unstudyable and it was measuring some sort of, you know, innate quality that you had based on your, I guess, genetics and um, and, you know, how well you had done in school, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And yet there was an entire test prep industry that I grew up on yeah. Long Island in, a, in an affluent <laughs> right. suburb. Um, there was an entire yeah. test prep industry that literally every kid did. Every single kid was taking, what was it, like Peterson or Kaplan or one of those things. Yeah, I remember that too. That was what was at high school, you know, same time and and same thing. We all went to the the, the Kaplan test prep study course after school Mm -hmm. to study specifically for the SAT. And then we all took the SAT and we all fucking did better. Like, obviously, because... They told you stuff like, hey, uh, if you don't know the answer, guess, but don't guess A, because that's it's le- least likely to be A on multiple choice. Exactly. If you guess, which, which is just crazy. basic. Some kids don't, don't get that training. Right. And they do yeah. worse on the test. And therefore, the test was wrong. So I'm sorry, again, this is not about uh, standardized testing, but I think there's still a similarity there. Well, there's even I mean, it, you can do it earlier. So very, very affluent families know another trick, which is that you can get your kids tested into a gifted and talented education program. Mm-hmm. If you if you coach them when they're like four, you know, and so yeah. you can do like a, um, I mean, and I'm not saying whether, you know, that you or I are like, weren't like affluent enough to I mean, I wasn't personally, but I, you know, I have no idea your specific situation or, you know, other people's situations. But I think that, um, there are like, it it will surprise some, some viewers and listeners to know that you can actually hire companies to do that work and to track them Mm -hmm. even earlier if you want to. And that's just absolutely not fair. And it's very expensive, but 
if you're if that's your goal, if your goal is to like make sure that you know little Janie gets into um, into Harvard, you know, and you you're just set on that. Like you, if you have the means, you can just throw a bunch yeah. of money at it and make make things you know more well, I'll likely tell you, to be I, real. I I I was not. You know, uh, my parents did not pay for that sort of service at, at that young of an age, but yeah. I know that I was tracked into a higher level of schooling at every level. Right. right. Um, my parents were both uh, both had PhDs um, and they, you know, moved to a particular school district in order to so that mm. we could go to, uh, you know, one of the one of the better public schools in the area on Long Island. It was a very good right. school. It wasn't even that rich of a school. It was just good. Um, but, you know, as a kid, I was told I was intelligent. Um, right. I also though had, uh, I was put into the higher level of all the classes. I started reading at a young age. There were a lot of books in the house as a kid. I acted out a lot. I had ADD. I was really, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'd run around and yell and scream and stuff like that. And I was chastised a lot for that. But also the response to when that happened when I was a kid was they actually tracked me higher. They said, Oh, this kid is, mm -hmm. uh, he's acting out cause he's bored. He must mm -hmm. need to uh, be take more advanced classes. So I actually skipped wow. a grade in elementary school um, yeah. because they thought I needed more challenge. And mm -hmm. then when I was in you know, middle school, there was like a gifted and talented program that I was put in with a couple other kids. Now, again, not yeah. like my parents are calling the school up but, uh, right. for it. It just sort of happened that way. Um, and, uh, then when I was in high school, it was, you know, there were, there were, I was one of the kids who did all the AP classes. And at that point, right. it was like, there were just like tiers of the school. There was, there were the AP yeah. class kids, there were the regular kids. And then there were the kids who started getting tracked into vocational programs where they went and learned air conditioning repair and stuff like that, right. or like, right. you know, et cetera. And, you know, I, I benefited from all of that. I don't, my parents weren't doing anything nefarious. That's just sort mm -hmm. of the way that, uh, the, a, what they were encouraged to do by the system and B, how that advantage compounds mm -hmm. upon itself. Um, and, it really does. you know, intelligence leads to intelligence leads to intelligence um, it, one after another. And I was very aware that there were kids in the same school who were not getting that same treatment. I was, you know, a mm -hmm. child, so I didn't really know what to do about that. But um, yeah, it's it's like pervasive. And and I can only imagine if I was a kid in a different circumstance who when I acted out, they said, oh, this kid's dumb. Let's put him in the dumb class, mm -hmm. make him take a test to prove that he's dumb, not treat him well. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then tell yeah. him that he's dumb over and over again. And one of the most depressing parts of the story is that students of color actually get disciplined and a lot of them get removed from school for mm -hmm. the same exact behavior so yeah. um, at one of the classes that I teach at my university is called mental illness. And it's really a mental health and illness class. It's not like I just talk about, you know, disease or something, you know, but I talk about learning disorders. I talk about all kinds of, you know, I talk about ADD. I talk about everything, everything under the sun, mental, right? And um, one of the, the harsh statistics is that um, students of color particularly black students and Latinx and, you know, but especially black students are disciplined for the very behaviors that white and Asian students are, um, are given special um, permissions and a lot of the time um, therapy and psychological support for. And mm. so you've got like the same exact behaviors, but you've got different um approach and then outcome. Right. And, yeah. and so you get kids who are basically given detention and then they're suspended and then they're taken to, you know, to like, they're taken into the courts and then they're taken into juvenile hall or whatever, you know, they're taken, they're removed from school or, you know, it's, it's just really unfortunate because it's like the same exact thing going on in a different classroom or in the same classroom, you know, with people with, a different appearance yeah. and skin color and you know it's like you know you were saying intelligence begets intelligence begets intelligence and it's really like perceived intelligence yeah begets perceived intelligence and as a as a person as a parent i'm a parent i've got three little kiddos um and as a person with a phd um, and my husband's a musician, but, you know, he's got a graduate education as well. And, um, 
was in a PhD program at one point. And so it's like, you know, I, I already see how we've got two kids that are in kindergarten at public school now. And we've, we've got one in preschool as well. And I can see how, you know, how there's just a, a belief that kids who have parents who are highly educated are going to yeah. be easier, easier kids to teach, you know, even, even though the schools want to create the most equal sets of circumstances for everybody, you know, like they want that, but there's a kind of orientation towards parents who have a lot of education. That's just a little bit different. And so I can see how that yeah. gets, you know, it, it gets turned into this like perceived intelligence that yeah. will continue to help, you know, the future generations of our families and then are going to not be there for the other students who don't have that same education background and culture uh, in a sense, like culture of education yeah. in their families. And just how willfully blind do you have to be to, to ignore all that and say intelligence is, is genetic, you know, uh, it, exactly. it's, it's sort of stunning to me. Uh, well, look, I, I want to find out more from you about your positive view of what intelligence actually is and what, what we okay. can mean by it and how we can increase it. But we have to take another quick break. We have to, we'll come right back with Maureen Bliss. Okay, everybody, so you know that it is healthier and cheaper to cook at home, but it is kind of hard getting all those ingredients together, learning how to cook, following the recipes, right? Well, HelloFresh has you covered. HelloFresh takes the hassle out of mealtime this spring by delivering pre-portioned ingredients and easy to prepare, pre and easy, easy to, not easy to say, but easy to prepare recipes right to your door. Skip the checkout lines and get outside in the warmer weather because HelloFresh has dinner covered for you, okay? And get this, good food is too precious to waste, right? And HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients cut down on your food waste by at least 23% compared to grocery shopping, which is good for your wallet and the planet. They help keep your taste buds on their toes with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week. With so much variety, there are options for everyone and every lifestyle. I was just browsing through their website, looking at all the wonderful things on the menu. I like to eat veggie a lot of the time, and they have so many great options here they have one pan cheesy black bean tacos they've got a greek goddess quinoa bowl but you know also sometimes my girlfriend she eats more meat than i do she likes a little bit of uh you know she wants a little bit more of the protein and they've got pepita crusted salmon doesn't that sound nice i don't even know what pepita is but i'm gonna learn i'm gonna improve my cooking skills once i get my hand on that box from hello fresh so if that sounds good to you get this with our special deal you can get 50 percent off plus your first box ships Free. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Factually50 and use the code Factually50 for 50% off plus your first box ships free. That's HelloFresh.com slash Factually50 to get in on HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Okay, we're back with Rena Bliss. Uh, we've talked for quite a while now about all the problems with the historical way that intelligence has been understood and the way it's been used against people. Uh, I want to spend more time talking about what is your view of intelligence? How should we actually understand it? You said it's learning from our environment. Tell me more about what that means. Like, what does it mean to be highly intelligent using that uh, under that model? Yeah, I think that um, just... Highly intelligent would be having a great awareness of the opportunity to learn from your environment. Mm. I want us to get to the point where we see the potential in everybody to do this and where we actually empower people to do this. But if people don't even know that there is this opportunity to learn, then, you know, it's not, it's like, where, where are you going to go with that? Um, and what I mean is not that we, spend every single waking moment of our lives learning things. It's just more like being aware that our environment is presenting us with opportunities. Should we decide that this is the moment to take those, take, take our environment up on it. Um, so, you know, for example, it's like you're sitting in a room, I'm sitting in a room. I think you have your dog in your room. Um, yeah. you know, there are so many things that you could learn about, think about, know about, 
more about him or her. <laughs> it's Annie, right? So about yeah, Annie's her. my dog. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, you know, there are so many things that you could be learning about, thinking about, knowing about in terms of like, you know, the audio, the visual stuff, you know, the technology that you have around you. There's so much that we can learn about anything in any environment. It's true in our work environments. It's also true in our, you know, enjoyment environments and our leisure moments of our days and stuff like that. And in our family settings and whatnot. And so, um, so there are always these moments and opportunities. Um, and unfortunately a lot of people aren't aware of that. And so then they are just kind of like, you know, moving through life in this way of like, you know, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And I've got to like, just, you know, roll through. Um, and so one of the things that I like to talk about in, and that I write about in, in rethinking intelligence is, um, first of all, adopting a growth mindset. So Mm -hmm. shifting from, again, thinking of yourself as a score or like a fixed amount of intelligence to a person in process, a person who's always learning, always developing, always neuroplastic, always having more opportunities to learn. Um, And also I talk about how important mindfulness is because it's a really good way to kind of calm yourself, reduce stress and mm-hmm. it's also a good way to tune into the learning environment, right? To, to tune into the learning opportunities in your environment. One thing I say is seize the learning moment. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's kind of like a little slogan, you know, just like, just do it, like seize that moment. Um, yeah. And also, um, also just see that there are always opportunities to learn with people around you. There's something I write about called connected learning, and it's just basically learning in collaboration, synergistically, and with an emotional connection to another person or other people. And it's it's a more effective way to learn. You know, you were saying Mm -hmm. how like there are so many different aspects to um, to being intelligent, and what was going through my mind was there's so many different aspects to memory, for example. Yeah. There are different parts of your brain that are working on retrieval, on cementing in new information, on comparing new and old information, on um, retaining information and getting back into the deep long ago kind of memories and looking at the short term kind of like closer, you know, closer to the present moment kind of memories and so it's like there, there are just there's so much there, you know, and um, and we see in learning research in particular that when you have information connected to a context and connected to like the like real life, and especially when you are engaging with others about that information, you retain the information better. You actually mm. learn better. So yeah. one of the things that I um, want us to do is really just try to have that conjure up that emotional component and that life, real life kind of component to the learning yeah. moment. Uh, you talk about neuroplasticity and how we can, yeah. uh, you know, our, we, we keep growing and changing. Um, and I'm curious how that interacts with, you know, aptitudes, because uh, if we're talking mm-hmm. about, I, I assume that you, you would agree there's different dimensions of intelligence. There's different mm-hmm. areas in which one can be intelligent. You go, someone could be very uh, intelligent about music, right? And understand it very clearly. Mm-hmm. And some people, you know, feel very, uh, uh, you know, unable to, you know, process it. Right. Yeah. Um, I used to think of myself as being someone who didn't have a lot of social intelligence. You know, I would, I was always mm-hmm. accidentally uh, offending people. I was sort of making blunders, <laughs> moving through social situations. Um, I felt uh, very separate from other people. I felt that I couldn't really mm-hmm. read or understand how people felt. And then in my 20s, I started doing stand-up comedy constantly. And uh, it, it cured me of a lot of social anxiety through, I guess, pure exposure. But now mm-hmm. I feel that the exact thing that I used to feel I was bad at is something I'm very good at in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, being in a You know, if I'm in a social power structure, I'm meeting a lot of new people. If I'm, say, engaged in a new television project and I meet a bunch of new producers I've never met with, I'm pretty good at figuring out who is who, how are they in relation to each other, how do each of them feel about this, what are the various power structures, what are the things I should watch out for, how do I, if I have a problem or if I need something from someone, how do I approach them in a way that will make them 
you know, uh, receptive rather than offended that I asked, that I made a request of them, that, that sort of thing, you know, basic social yeah. politics. I, I feel that I now am better at than other people. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, if you had asked me 15 years ago, I would have said, no, I suck at that. I should never try to, you know, engage in that sort of sphere. I'm more of a, you know, techie kind of computer programmer -y kind of guy. Um, mm -hmm. and now I feel kind of the opposite. Um, how, uh, like is, uh, yeah, how, how yeah. fluid are we in that way? I think we're, we're extremely fluid. I mean, really, I, I talk about how we have infinite potential and I mean it mm. in terms of like what information you can put into your mind, you know, like we think we, like, we oh, have an you infinite, know, we have like an yes. infinite capacity in our minds. Really? Yes, we can. We, well, you know, we can put different kinds of information in there. It's mm. not like, you know, you are, you were really just only good at one thing and you like somehow you're your whole atomness changed and you became the opposite person. No, you're the same person. It's just that now you care a lot about that. Mm. So you care and you invest time and thought and energy into learning that. That's like one of your things that you grow about, right? And that's the thing about neuroplasticity is that you can actually go in any direction you want. You can learn a lot of languages or you can not learn a lot of languages. Do you, is that something your culture cares about? Is that something you care about? Is that something that everybody is like, you have to do this, you know? What are the things that we think, like, you know, Americans living in this day and age are, what do we think everyone needs to know? What do we think everyone has to come out from school knowing, right? It's like, yes, we will have, most people will have those basics because we say that's what they need to know. Um, Unfortunately, we don't say that people need to be able to read the room. We don't say mm -hmm. that people need to be empathetic to other people, that people need to understand how, what others are going through, that before they, you know, um, you know, say something that they have to kind of consider the other person's perspective or experiences or how they might make them feel, you know, yeah, there's no classes mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. social dynamics. No, we don't do that, you know, so we're not going to raise kids who are doing that thing. Um, and uh, so my family is half of it lives here in the U.S. and half is in Indonesia. So it's mm. really an education for me. I go over there and there's just like different values, you know. Um, one of the things that's really different is that our media is very violence oriented. And um, and like most of the narratives about you know, what you'd see on TV and what you see on streaming and what you see in movies and stuff is so much around, um, weapons and violence and, you know, just like abuse and like, you know, really like tor torture and stuff like that. And then yeah. over there, it's like, not at all, you know? So it's like all like kind of what would probably be more similar to our 1950s, maybe media or something, you know, except without like the crazy, you know, mom does this, dad does this kind of like, you know, crap. But, um, but it's like, they, it's just, it's completely different. And it's a lot like all the, the narratives are more about families, families figuring out how to get along families, like, like people facing like challenges at work or something like that, or challenges at school and having to like solve a problem together. And like, you know what I mean? So it's just yeah. really different. You know, you, you go, to one place and you have people who are really about learning how to be a part of a group and to, you know, take care of the different people in different ages. That's another thing that's super different is that in one household, you have all these different generations, you have great, great grandparents, you know what I mean? Um, and you have like all the generations and then here people are more atomized, like the families are nuclear and they're just like, kind of like, here's us and our kids. And then our parents are somewhere else and really somewhere else, you know, at this yeah. point, like they're in some other part of the country. Um, I'm from LA and, you know, I did my graduate work in New York city and lived there for like 10 years. And now I live in Princeton, New Jersey, you know, and none of our family lives here. And so, you know, when, um, when you look at us here, it's just, it's just, our values are completely different. We're much more about like, um, just giving kids 
basic reading math skills and a very individualistic and I would say narcissistic kind of way of being towards other people. So we're not yeah. preparing people to learn in the way that I'm saying we should, you know, I would like yeah. that to change. Um, but yeah, I think that if we, if we had social and emotional learning as like on our priority list at the top there, um, yeah. I think that we would have better learning throughout the whole entire education career of a, of a human being in this country. And um, we'd probably work out a lot of those inequality issues as well. <laughs> yeah. If we had that, if, if we just had basic training on those points, I mean, it's so funny that I, I think of one of the other things that helped my, my social intelligence improve was mm -hmm. um, I read that uh, this is going to sound corny, but I will proclaim this book to the, to the high heavens, Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people. I mm -hmm. found a copy of this book in a thrift store when I was like 24 or something like that. And I was flipping through it on a family vacation and I, I don't know why I picked it up. But I was like, oh, this is a funny book. This is a famous book. I'll see what's in it. And it gave such basic advice about uh, uh, like the advice in this book. First of all, it sounds very cynical title. It's not a cynical book. It's literally mm -hmm. how to be nice and respectful to people and why everything is better when you do that. And so the advice in this book is people like it when you say their name. Did you know that, Rena? Mm -hmm. Did you know that people like it when, yes. when you say their name? I love <laughs> it, it was... when you say my name. <laughs> <laughs> and another one was, this is the best piece of advice I've ever gotten. If you want someone to do something for you, if you need something from someone, you need to explain to them why it's in their best interest. Why does mm -hmm. it benefit them to do it? So, you know, that that is, I use that every day, right? If I'm like, hey, mm -hmm. I, I, I need... Um, uh, you know, Hey Rena, I, I'd love it if you wore headphones during this interview and you'll mm -hmm. sound so much better on the interview and mm -hmm. you'll make a better impression mm -hmm. on our audience. Right. I don't say, I really want you to do that. I say it would help you to do it. Um, and th this is extremely basic stuff. And what you're enlightening me to is it came to me as a revelation in my mid twenties. This is something that we don't teach. And it's something that we mm -hmm. don't, uh, even attempt to teach, uh, to let be, in fact, we denigrate that, ah, that's self-help. It's bullshit. You know, when in fact, yeah. this is like, it's basic, uh, social socializations, basic social skills. Um, I, I want to ask you about, uh, 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 learning as we age, right. Or intelligence as we age, because yes. I'm getting a little bit older now and a, uh, I love that you're talking about the plastic plasticity of the brain as we get older. And I'd love to hear more about that because uh, something I've confronted recently is I've uh, adopted throughout much of my life this idea of learning as that I'm going to cram stuff into my brain and that it'll go up infinitely, right? Every time I read a book, I'm importing the knowledge from that book, from the pages to my mind, and I'm going to remember it. And there's a lot of reading culture that is still based around that kind of, you know, uh, very productive kind of learning, pr productivity focused. There's all kinds of guides yeah. on the internet how, how to take efficient notes so that you don't just <laughs> remember the things that you read. You also like, it, you, you know, in, it, it increase your intelligence by internalizing them and shit like that. And as I get older, I'm, I realize that's bullshit. Like half of the shit that I read, more than half of it just falls out of my mind. I never remember it again. I'm reading it for some other reason. But yet I still want to feel that uh, I am improving as I get older, that I'm that I'm learning new things, that I'm growing and that I'm increasing my capabilities in some way. And I feel that I am, but I'm not entirely sure how. And so what, what do you what, what do you know that I don't know about okay. uh, intelligence and how we can continue increasing it as we age? Well, there are two things here, and I hope I'll remember both of them because I'm also <laughs> getting older. Um, one of them is that we are always um, changing and we are always able to form new neural networks and that does um, slow down in some ways as we get older but we can do what neuroscientists have shown have shown is the best way to learn which is to learn in bits so learn a little bit and then rest mm. learn a little bit more and then rest so instead of cramming that doesn't really work because mm. you'll get the information in like your eyes will register it. And you might even like, you know, go ahead and take those great notes and whatnot, but it won't be really soaked in there without rest 
a time for your body to kind of recuperate your brain to like shut down and, and, you know, chill out. And then, um, the other part of it is that it's much better to learn in context. So to learn by doing, to learn by interacting. So even if it's not by doing in the sense of like, you're not going to like do, um, like you were talking about, um, a a self-help book or something, you know, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. It's like by doing meaning, talking about it with somebody that you care about, talking about how you would make the changes, what are the ways that you would implement it or just going and implementing. Right. So like reading a tiny little bit, like not more than a chapter, you know, just a little chat, like a chapter or even just like a piece of a chapter and then enacting the thing or using it, you know, and then um, again, resting. That's why, mindfulness practice meditation i love yoga nidra which is like the you know kind of like a longer kind of yogic sleep kind of way of um resting and kind of getting things to jumble around in there and get get cemented and everything Mm -hmm. um but yeah the unfortunately one of the ways that we are taught to learn in school is to just cram and also we're often in given, especially in public schools, we're given um, all kinds of information out, out of the context of anything, right? And so it's better if we can, as adults, if we have the choice to just go into learning something new as like saying, how can I enact this? And also be mindful yeah. of the need to rest and not like trying to, you know, do what I used to do when I was in my PhD, where I would read a whole book in an afternoon because I just had so many books that I had to read. And I was like, okay, I'm going to read like this book at this part of the day. And then this other book and then this other book and this other book. It's like, yes, I did read all the books on the list and I did, you know, get to pass the classes and whatnot, but none of them matter to me in, in this day and age, you know, none of that matters to me. All that matters are the things that I actually enacted things that I yeah. practice, things that I did with other people, especially people I loved, you know, that's where you build memories. You build like, you know, that kind of like your heart is in it. Your soul yeah. is in it, you know? Yeah. Learning things that you're not just learning from a book that, but that you're doing or that you're exploring or that you're doing with other people. Um, yeah. that that's real as opposed to like, Oh geez, I should learn about the history of the atom or whatever. If that's an yeah. interest area, if that's something that you're that you're uh, actively exploring, that you have an interest in with other folks, that you can go participate in, that's great. Mm-hmm. But if you're just like trying to cram in order to like an intelligent person should know about this, you're you're actually probably not going to benefit much from it. Exactly, and and you know why? Like, why would anyone want to learn that way? I just it's kind of like you were asking about the the Mensa Club. It's like, but why? Yeah. What is in it for you? You know, the, the book you mentioned, I've actually given that as a gift, you know? So yeah. I, I think it's a great book and it's a great resource. And it's, it's like, it's the, I like that. What's in it for me? What's in it for them? What's in it for, you know, what is in it for us? And if you learn yeah. like that, where it's just like trying to check a bunch of boxes, it's just like, okay, you'll check the boxes. Sure. Yeah. You know, but are you going to be smarter from that? Are you really going to be transformed? Like we want to be transformed by knowledge. We don't want to just be like, Oh, I did it. You know, I performed it. Sure. I, that's, that's actually one, one way of looking at it. It's just to ask yourself the question, am I performing something or am I, am I, you know, getting something out of, am I being transformed? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's kind of a funny way to, to say it because you're a performer, you know? So it's like, you know when you're performing because you're going on stage and you're ready to do it, right? And it's yeah. like, I'm performing. But like, do you want the rest of your time, especially when you're learning and stretching your mind to be like a performance? Probably not, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it gets very exhausting. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I do, I am guilty of, of doing that too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, to, to end us here, I'd love to uh, ask, um, you know, one of our goals in schooling and our education system is to, you know, we want to raise the intelligence level of our entire society. You know, that's sort of the mm-hmm. point of of public schooling or of making sure that every child has an, has an education. We care about the, the education and the intelligence of individual kids, but we also know that we sort of want the 
intelligence of the entire society to continue rising in a general way that that's mm-hmm. important even just for the economy, right? Just on the Mm -hmm. most cynical basis, you need an educated populace. Um, Mm -hmm. But we, of course, care about that for moral reasons and and reasons of just it being a good thing. So how, in your view, in the last few minutes we have, (laughs) I know it's a big question to ask, but but like what what changes, if you could design a a way Mm -hmm. of educating uh, children, uh, how would, what would it be in order to give us the highest level of intelligence we can? Well, the first thing is change our school environments from places where we score kids and track them based on scores to a place where every child is seen as an individual and Mm -hmm. is treated as valuable and is treated as a person with infinite potential to learn and is given that that respect and that grace so that they can learn. And, um, And to take the kind of punitive way of of dealing with kids who are neurodivergent out of the equation, because that just, it just ruins it for everybody. It also yeah. makes the whole classroom environment and the school environment a really untrustworthy place for kids. You mm. know, even if it's not happening to your kid or to like you, it's like, it's happening to other people and it's not, it's, it's, it's just awful. You know, um, it lowers the morale of, of all the learners there. So, you know, that's one thing. But we actually can't fix all the problems within the classroom because we would need to really equalize our other learning environments because we're not only in classrooms. So I'm saying like we need to equalize our neighborhoods. And that is that takes a whole lot of economic willpower and a lot of political willpower that, you know, hopefully we can generate. And I, I think that generationally speaking, we're getting wiser to this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that we have a long ways to go. Having equalizing our environments as our main priority, first top priority, and then having the social and emotional learning part of it being our second priority, I think that those are the two things that I want to see us do. I think that that will actually raise everything. It raises our standard of living, which is going to raise even those flawed test scores. And, um, it's also going with the social and emotional piece of it. You're going to have students actually for reals learning and retaining things and finding meaning and being transformed. Yeah. And these are changes that would benefit everybody if we were to enact them, that it's, it's not, it's not a matter of being soft on folks. It's a matter of, it's just like cleaning up pollution. Like so many countries want to do because they know that it's impacting their, uh, you know, their kids and their entire society. And they're like, Hey, this is something that we need to do. Uh, doing the same thing across our neighborhood saying, Hey, it's, it's bad for everybody when there's a neighborhood that's polluted. So folks mm-hmm. there have worse outcomes when there's uh, entire communities where people aren't able to have uh, secure home lives. So their kids show up to work, uh, show up to school, excuse me, sometimes work because child labor is a big problem in America again, but exactly. really school. <laughs> like it's yeah. bad for everybody that kids are being put to work and, and are not achieving their full potential. Like that's a drag on our entire society. And it's therefore a drag on you. Like your life is worse. Uh, even if you come from more fortunate means, if we're not taking care of each other. Yes, exactly. Well, Rena, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk to us about this. The book is called Rethinking Intelligence, and uh, you can get it at factuallypod.com slash books if you want to buy it from our special bookshop and support the show. Anywhere else that you'd like to shout out that where people can buy it, and where can people find you online? You can also uh, buy it, of course, at Amazon and at HarperCollins website. Um, and you can find more about me at my website, drrenabliss.com. Rena, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much, Adam. It was so fun. Well, thank you once again to Dr. Bliss for coming on the show. If you want to pick up a copy of her book, you can get it once again at factuallypod.com slash books. Your purchase there will support not just this show, but your local bookshop as well. I also want to thank everybody who supports this show at the $15 a month level on Patreon. Our most recent subscribers at that level are Always Sunny, McPwoninator, Ashley Molina Diaz, Ask, Ghost, Francisco Ojeda, Dark Avenger, Yet Another Mike, Pat, Hayden Matthews, and Eric Zeger. Thank you so much to all of them. If you want to 
to join them, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Thanks as always to my producer, Sam Roudman, my engineer, Kyle McGraw, and to the Falcon, fine folks at Falcon Northwest for building me the wonderful custom gaming PC that I record every episode of this podcast on. You can find my tour dates at adamconover.net and you can find me at Adam Conover wherever you get your social media. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time on Factually. Star Avenue, a, podca- <clears throat> a podcast network.